Good evening and welcome to this webinar on the long-term health consequences of COVID-19. I'm Associate Professor Rebecca Haddock and I'm the Executive Director for the Knowledge Exchange at the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association. And it's my pleasure to be your host today. Before we get underway, I would like to first acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'm currently on the lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We are set for a very stimulating discussion this evening and I'm sure it will inspire some questions. We will have a dedicated Q&A session after we've heard from the speakers, but please feel free to ask your questions as they occur to you via the Q&A function you'll find at the bottom of your screen. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to exert an extraordinary and pervasive impact on societies, economies and health systems across the world. Its direct morbidity and mortality impacts march onwards. As of today, there have been over 474 million cases and more than 6 million deaths due to COVID worldwide. Health services planning for COVID-19 has understandably focused on mortality, hospital admissions and intensive care capacity alongside vaccination and public health control measures. However, concerns about the long-term consequences of the pandemic must now also turn to the long-term clinical sequelae being seen in survivors of COVID-19. Although long COVID is not yet fully understood, it has already placed a significant burden on countries which have suffered more acutely from the pandemic than Australia. As the country has reopened and mandates rolled back, long COVID caseloads here have also risen and the health system should be preparing to address them. Tonight we are lucky enough to hear about long COVID from four experts in this field. Dr. Itzik Levy will be discussing the hospital experience of long COVID in Israel. Dr. Gail Orsop, who has kindly pre-recorded a discussion of the primary care experience of long COVID in the UK. Professor Martin Henscher, who will examine the likely burden and health system impacts of long COVID and post-COVID illness in Australia. And last but not least, Professor Mark Morgan, who will talk to us about the development of the Australian evidence-based clinical guidelines for long COVID. Good evening. Uh, first, I would uh, like to thank you and uh, to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to be here and present this talk this evening. It's really a great honor for me and for our uh, medical center. I do believe that this introductory slide tells the whole story. No doubt that long COVID is a severe disease and uh, which interrupts severely with patient's life. And it's in other unexplained situations in medicine, the medical system treats it like a hot potato which means that everybody thinks that this problem should be treated by someone else. I do hope that the guidelines that we'll talk about this evening will try to take this hot potato and to cool it down and to see how it's everybody's problem and not only just uh, belongs to one category. So a little bit about our center, about Shiba. We are actually the biggest tertiary academic center in the country established in 1948, includes 1,800 beds in all three hospitals that are included in the center. We have a general hospital rehabilitation center and a very big pediatric center. I'm proud to say that we were chosen to be one of the 10 best hospitals in four years for a row now. So no wonder that when the corona pandemic entered Israel on February 2020, we actually were the first to build the Corona Center. First in tents, I still remember the first one, which the first wind came during the winter time and took away. But very soon, the main parking lot of the hospital was turned into an excellent Corona intensive care unit, in addition to many departments that were devoted for COVID patients. Just a few months later, we started to see some strange things that we, at least I never saw before in patients that suffered COVID. Here are some examples. In the first two cases here on the left, there were patients who ran the Tel Aviv Marathon, which uh, took place on February, just a few weeks before Corona began. And now they were not uh, able to walk even for a few hundred meters without stopping. You know, I remember a very young soldier who ran the marathon and now after 300 meters, he should stop and take his breath. And then on the right side, you can see an example of two uh, patients. One was a lawyer 
the other one was a teacher. They both complained on new memory and concentration problems. And here you can see the uh, Montreal uh, cognitive tests, which I think that even those who are not familiar with the test can see that something is really wrong here. Here uh, they are asked to copy the cube and you can see that it was a, not a very good copy. And here they are asked to draw a clock which shows the time 10 minutes to two and they were both failing to do this clock. So actually we started to see more and more strange things that we couldn't give them a name. We couldn't know and understand what's going on. Uh, so, so at this point, we started to understand something about what's going in the acute phase, even before, even in the, you know, the immunological stage, the, the virological stage, we understood nothing about what's happening after the patient has been recovered. And I think that here was the first time when my boss used the sentence that I still, I'm still using two years later now. We learned a lot, we know a lot, but actually we know nothing. So on May 2020, we opened a first post-acute COVID clinic and started a clinical study. And actually the definition we used was uh, actually very similar to the definition that the uh, NICE and other organizations are using today uh, to define patients with long COVID. Uh, acute, if acute COVID is the signs and symptoms of COVID for the first four weeks, when actually we assume that a, a viral a, a stage and immunological stage are still in their acute phase. Ongoing or persistent symptomatic COVID are signs and symptoms occurring from four to 12 weeks. Then the post COVID or long COVID syndrome was defined by signs and symptoms that were developed during or after infection that continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. We did not include in our clinical, in our uh, study, patients with severe respiratory or systemic disease during the acute phase, especially those which were ventilated or needed an ECMO machine, because we knew that here many uh, complications may be attributable to the ventilation process of the ECMO itself and not for the uh, COVID, uh, not to COVID. And since we did not uh, have children in our department, so we did not, did not include it also PIMS and like syndromes, which mainly occur in uh, children. And uh, here we want only uh, to show what we found in the first 200 patients. To remind you, there were not study yet at uh, that time. So it was the first 200 uh, patients uh, but the same data was found later in numerous studies in much larger populations, uh, also in our uh, population, which became bigger and bigger. And what we found is that severe fatigue, memory impairment, depression, anxiety, and back to physical activity were the most common uh, findings in those patients. And as you can see, it uh, continued for more than 12 weeks uh, the severe fatigue in about half of the patients, memory impairment in about a quarter of the patients, and also back to physical activity disturbance was in about a quarter of the patients. Uh, later, we did a multivariate analysis to see what may uh, are the risk factors for uh, those persistent symptoms. And we found that from all the data we put in, being a female and the number of the symptoms in the acute phase not the severity, were actually the most important uh, risk factors for the disease. And then after we showed the, this uh, data uh, in Israel, the Minister of Social Affairs, Affairs asked us uh, for a meeting and uh, he asked us several questions. Is this real? Is it anything like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia? What is the rate? How long does it take to rehab and go back to work? What are the resources that should be allocated for diagnosis and medical treatment, for rehabilitation, for assured income? Well, actually we didn't have any answer for him 
And we also ask ourselves the same questions. We even didn't know at that time, what is the pattern? How can we predict it? So we, the first question that he asked us was, is it real? How can we know if a syndrome, a new syndrome or a new disease is real? There are four ways to know this, or at least to suspect. If there is a sound biological base, if there is a proof of concept, if there is an epidemiological correlation, or if it appears the same way in remote and different geographical cultural areas. So let's start with the first one. Is there a sound biological background? So I must tell you that all the departments of the center, and of course, all over the world started to do hundreds of trials, clinical trials, basic science, to see if there is some biological uh, uh, background. Our pulmonologist did a cardio a pulmonary a exercise tests and other pulmonary tests. The cardiologist did cardiac MRI and other things. The neurologist did the brain uh, MRIs, functional MRIs, and nervous biopsies, etc., etc., etc. And in all those studies, you know, there was some findings, minimal findings, but nothing consistent could be found. Exercise capacity was okay in all the patients. The pulmonary test was uh, fine. The echocardiogram, the MRI of the heart, you know, it showed maybe minimal uh, findings, but nothing that can really explain this uh, new syndrome. So is the result biological background? Probably yes, but we could not find it yet. You know, and this is very interesting. I just read this this week. Uh, I want uh, to read it for you too. Scientists have proposed many explanations for long COVID, but several I spoke to agreed that there are now two leading theories that symptoms are driven by the immune system or by the persistence of the virus in the body. Importantly, those aren't mutually exclusive and it's likely that both factors are at play and interconnected together with a number of other mechanisms. I must tell you, this was written this week, but I could tell it uh, to even two years ago. Of course, it's the virus and the immunological system, but what is exactly the interplay? What exactly happens there in the system that they uh, cause those uh, symptoms? So again, we learned a lot. We know a lot, but still we know nothing. Is there a proof of concept? Well, I think that everybody knows that after many virological uh, and even some bacterial uh, diseases, there is a persistence fatigue in some of the patients. We know the post-viral fatigue after influenza, which may continue for about four weeks. We know that after infectious mononucleosis, especially CMV, post-viral fatigue can continue even for six months. And we saw it after polio. In HIV, we still don't know what causes the HIV-associated neurocognitive disturbance, which uh, resembles a little bit the foggy head we see in long COVID. We see it in Lyme disease, et cetera, et cetera. So we think that there is some proof of concept that virological uh, uh, disease may cause you uh, a long after a uh, viral disease. Is there an epidemiological contest does it appear the same way in different geographical areas and cultures? Definitely so. After so many studies and everybody, I think in every country showed 20% of patients with long COVID, 40% patients of, patient, uh, of patients uh, with long COVID. So we can say definitely, but even here, I have a question mark because if you are looking at the data and uh, I think it's uh, the nice work that put all those studies, epidemiological studies in a table, and they try to find the certainty of the evidence, the quality of the evidence. And I think that you can see that it was very low in all those studies. So is there an epidemiological context? Maybe we can shed a little, uh, 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 put some doubt in it. And I love really this slide because of the subtle English health authorities, which uh, show uh, this very low quality of the epidemiological studies. So again, we are still with our same questions. How long, what is the pattern? pattern how can we predict it? So like many colleagues in many parts of the world, we try to do another study. 
And at this time, we did an online survey. We used the immediate messaging system to message a questionnaire for the first patients that we had with COVID. We included, as you can see, more than 2,000 patients, about 100 were healthcare workers, and the others were patients which were not uh, healthcare workers. But you can see that only about a third of the patients uh, responded to us. And also it's very biased because probably only symptomatic patients, or at least the risk that the symptomatic, uh, the odds of the symptomatic patients, patients will respond is much higher. We can have some data. And we see that the average AJ was a uh, 50, 56 uh, six per, uh, percent of the patients they were males, most were Israeli born. There were no immunosuppressed patients in our uh, in this uh, work. And you can see <coughs> that during the acute phase, 83% of the patients were really symptomatic with the fever, cough, uh, were the most common symptoms, also myalgia and weakness. And I think that the most important uh, part because this is less biased information, is that you can see that about 20% of the patients, 20% of the patients and 15% of healthcare workers that had COVID were still suffering the long corona symptoms more than nine months after recovering corona. Uh, the symptoms were like what we found before. Uh, uh, excuse me, here are the symptoms. Uh, most uh, common symptoms were fatigue, exercise intolerance, memory. So it's like in the first work and like in all the other works. And if we are looking in the multivariate analysis about the odds ratio for long uh, COVID symptoms, you can see again that being a female and uh, having a lung disease and being symptomatic were the most common uh, risk factors for long COVID. So at this time, we started to look at long COVID actually as a deconditioning state. And what we recommended our authorities, including in the hospital, is to rule out other unexpected diagnoses. This should be made by primary care and as needed by a specialist. Must tell you that uh, among all the patients that we uh, examined with long COVID, we found two patients with Jacob Kreutzfeld, which was not related, of course, to COVID. We found patients with hypothyroidism, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to exclude other unexpected diagnoses. Uh, we were dealing with symptomatic relief and reassurance. And we think that the most important thing we did was to build a multidisciplinary uh, rehabilitation approach, which included physiotherapists and physical trainers for the physical inability or intolerance and occupational therapist for the patients with foggy heads. Uh, it's about half of the patients are doing it physically in the hospital. They are coming to the rehabilitation center and another half are doing it digitally uh, from a long distance because many patients are living in the periphery and it's very difficult for them to arrive to the hospital. So actually we have a unit which is called Shiba Beyond and we are doing it digitally. And uh, we feel that it really helps the patients. We are now gathering the data. So I hope soon in several months, we can present also this data. And if you are looking at the nice guidelines, because I know that all this meeting today is about writing guidelines, look what they write. Discuss the person's experience of their symptoms and how their life and activities have been affected including work, education, mobility, and independence. Ask about any feelings of worry or distress. Listen to their concern with empathy and acknowledge the impact on their day-to-day -day life, etc., etc. This was written now for long COVID, but actually this is what I teach my students about HIV, about diabetes, about any other chronic disease. So I think that also uh, things are new because long COVID is still new to us. The empathy that we have for our patients is not new and it's the same like what we used to do 50 and probably 100 years ago. So I wish I would know more tomorrow
And as I told you in the beginning, we learned a lot, we know a lot, but we know nothing. Thank you very much for your attention and all the members of our team and the patients. Thank you, Itzik. Our next speaker um, has said through a presentation from um, the UK, Dr. Gail Alsop. She is the clinical lead for clinical policy at the Royal College of General Practitioners. And she's going to talk about long COVID and primary care in the UK. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gail Alsop. I am a GP from England and I am firstly really sorry I can't be with you this evening to present this presentation but I was asked to share a recording which um, I'm doing. I will also put my email address at the end of the presentation so if anyone does have any questions please do feel free to contact me. So I am a GP and I see patients face to face but I also work as the clinical lead for clinical policy of the Royal College of General Practitioners in the UK as well. Now, I'm a GP in this very beautiful part of the world called Derbyshire, which is right in the centre of the country. So it's actually about as far away from the sea as you can get. But this is one of the reservoirs that I visit very regularly. And it's really important that I declare my conflicts of interest, as well as working clinically and with the Royal College of GPs. I've also recently been appointed as the interim chief medical officer for NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And I'm doing this role alongside my Royal College of GP roles. But today I'm speaking very much from a GP perspective and from the Royal College of GPs perspective particularly. So when we're talking about long COVID, I thought it'd be really interesting just to tell you our journey in the UK. And my journey started with Stacey, who was a patient of mine way back in April 2020. So right at the beginning of the pandemic. We were locked down in the UK in March 2020 for the first time um, when our case numbers were, were actually really quite high. Um, and Stacey was one of my first ever patients that I saw with COVID and then followed through and she didn't seem to be recovering. So in April 2020, she had a COVID-19. It was a clinical diagnosis. There was no testing available at the time. And she was managed at home with our support. A lot of what we did at that point was very remote. When she came back to see me in May 2020, she was still short of breath and she had what she described as a burning chest pain. Her respiratory rate was up and her oxygen levels were down. So, of course, at this point, I considered, was this a COVID pneumonia? What was going on? Was this a uh, pulmonary embolism? We just started to understand the blood clotting consequences of COVID by this point. So we referred her to hospital, the first admission, and her bloods all came back as being normal, as did her chest X-ray. And despite her low oxygenation, which very rapidly recovered after 24 hours on oxygen, she was just diagnosed with musculoskeletal pain because at this point we didn't know anything else. She then came back a month later saying she was still short of breath. And by this point, she was exhausted. Her respiratory rate was still high. She was short of breath at rest and when talking. Her oxygen saturations were a bit better this time, 94%. So we did some primary care investigations and they all came back as being normal. So a spirometry, ECGs, bloods and echoes. And at this point, she didn't really warrant an acute admission. So we spoke to our respiratory colleagues who suggested maybe a respiratory outpatient. They went uh, and, and saw her and, and she they basically said she had an ongoing shortness of breath because of her COVID-19 and requested a CT scan. But unfortunately, the uh, request was declined because there was no need for a CT scan, according to the respiratory consultant that reviewed her case. And the feeling was that despite the normal spirometry, this was possibly just reactive lungs or a, an asthma type presentation after COVID. And there was no need for the CT scan. Again, at a time we didn't really understand what was going on with COVID. So she carried on like this at home, tried some salbutamol inhaler, tried a few other inhalers. Nothing seemed to make a difference to a shortness of breath. Lots of gasping with that shortness of breath. And she came back in August and just said, I cannot do this anymore. And she was at the point of, of, of being broken almost. She was exhausted, shortness of breath. She was in and out of bed all the time. So this time, still not really understanding about long COVID, but referred her back and I asked for some what's called advice and guidance in the, in the UK just to say to the respiratory consultants, look, please, there must be something else going on. Again, we were told there was no CT scan required and maybe she just had anxiety, which was the cause of her shortness of breath. And at this point, as you can imagine, she felt like this, but so did I as a GP. I was seeing this in front of my eyes, someone who was not recovering from an acute COVID-19. 
So I started to ask my colleagues and there were multiple stories of the same thing. And I looked at the BMJ and there was a blog from somebody who had said as well they'd had COVID and not recovered. So I did a survey of GPs through my Royal College role and found that two thirds of GPs um, had seen this. And only about 7% had the diagnostics that they needed access to things like echoes and CT scans to rule out other diagnosis. By this point, there were some post-COVID clinics being set up in the UK, but mainly for people who'd been hospitalised and were then being discharged to follow them up because, of course, we needed to collect data. And about a quarter of clinicians had access to a post-COVID clinic, but only if secondary care had referred into them. And when we asked our general practice colleagues what were the persisting symptoms that they were seeing, this is what we came up with. And we now know this list is very typical of post-COVID syndrome or, or long COVID. Fatigue being the, the biggest part, but respiratory, shortness of breath, cardiovascular, neurological, psychiatric, whether that's brain fog or depression or an adjustment type symptom, but also the fever, gastroenteritis, pain, rashes, all the stuff that we didn't really understand at this point in time. And of course, this needed a huge holistic view. We needed to look at every system in the body for these patients, not just the respiratory side, which we thought perhaps this was the cause of. And 80 percent of our GPs who we asked said they needed some clinical guidance on this. And also there was no way of coding any of this in our notes. And without the coding, we didn't really know how much of a problem this was in primary care. So at the Royal College of GPs, we came together and we wrote some very early guidance um, for our GPs talking about what people should do. And we started to talk to lots of other partners. We started to talk to the government to lobby for people to write an, a guideline. We asked NICE and SIGN if they were going to write a guideline. We talked to academics who were studying this. We talked to the digital teams to look at coding. And there was also a digital uh, rehabilitation service that had been set up in Leicestershire which were for patients who'd been discharged from hospital to give them some ongoing support as they'd been discharged from your COVID recovery. And we started to talk to all these people just to really realise that there was a lot of work going on, but no coordination. And when we've managed to find some funding for the clinical guidelines, we as a Royal College, because we were so central and so integral to what was going on with the long COVID work, agreed to partner with both NICE and with SIGN to write the first ever guideline on what we now know as long COVID or post COVID syndrome. Since we started to write this, we have realised how many people have become involved in the long COVID work. And over the last two years since I've been involved in long COVID or post COVID syndrome work, the number of partners we've worked with has really just exploded from our rehabilitation partners to even things like the Scottish Royal Ballet who are doing rehabilitation programmes, but the Department of Health and Social Care, the House of Lords, the WHO, all sorts of people. Um, it's been really, really fascinating to watch this disease emerge. So the top tips that we wrote at the beginning for our GPs really talked about believing this is a real condition. We heard huge amounts from patients saying they didn't, they weren't being believed. What we also said was that anybody with an acute infection can go on to develop long term symptoms and they didn't need a positive test because, of course, there wasn't testing at that point and they didn't need to have been admitted to hospital. And that was really important because we were seeing huge numbers in the community who had this condition. Remembering it's a multi-system disease, a lot of people saying that they've been told it was anxiety or psychological and that a full history and appropriate examination was required to understand that impact and that um, investigations were needed. So excluding underlying pathology to make sure we weren't missing a pulmonary embolus or a lung cancer as a reason for their shortness of breath and that if people needed referring, we needed to refer them on. That guideline was used for a few months until the rapid guideline managing the long term effects of COVID-19 was published in December 2020. And as I said, this was a collaborative effort from NICE, the Royal College of GPs and SIGN, the Scottish Inter Intercollegiate Guideline Network. And as part of this, we also created a definition looking at all the evidence, listening to all of our key stakeholders. And what we realised is that acute COVID-19, looking at all of the evidence and all of the figures, really could take up to about four weeks. And at this point in time, the mantra from our leaders in the UK was saying, actually, you, most people got over COVID within two weeks. And indeed, probably most people did. But there was a significant number that took up to four weeks. So we had this diagnosis um, of acute COVID from zero to four weeks. Takes time to recover 
possibly still infective at that point. We then added this interim group because what we were realising from the numbers is that most people were getting better by about 12 weeks. And if we think about other viral infections and particularly pneumonias, the vast majority of people by three months will be better and certainly by six months will be recovered. So we needed to think about this natural resolution and we called this ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 because there was something still going on that may or may not get better. It also gave us time to rule out those alternative diagnoses. And then if people had symptoms after 12 weeks, this was called post-COVID syndrome. And the diagnosis of this was signs and symptoms that developed during or following an infection consistent with COVID-19, but weren't explained by an alternative diagnosis. So if we found cancer, that wasn't, you know, they weren't fatigued because of post-COVID syndrome, they were fatigued because of their cancer. And of course, sometimes these things coexisted. It was very clear that it was presenting with clusters of symptoms and often they overlap. So we realised that there were the respiratory symptoms, but there were the fatigue symptoms. There were also um, the, the symptoms that were more akin to people with allergies. So skin rashes, gastrointestinal disturbance, but sometimes these overlapped and they changed and fluctuated over the time. And really important, any system in the body. And very, very key, and, and what was coming from our patient representatives at this point is you don't need a positive test, whether that's antibody or PCR test or indeed lateral flow test now for a diagnosis of this to be made. Clinical diagnosis of COVID was enough. And we also made sure, because we were hearing reports of ongoing symptoms with children, that our definition included both adults and children. So in terms of patients in the community, we absolutely know everybody with post-COVID syndrome is community-based because they were either never admitted to hospital or they were discharged from hospital and now they were at home. And what we found at the time was about four in five COVID-19 infections were actually community-based and only about one in five in our first wave was being admitted to hospital. So that diagnosis phase was really important. That they could have a clinical diagnosis, but not be tested. It could be a retrospective clinical diagnosis, which was self-managed initially with or without a positive test, um, or indeed was managed by a general practitioner. Or it could have been someone who was tested because either they were tested in the community or in hospital. And in terms of the guidance, the NICE guidance really didn't say a great deal initially from what we'd put out in our interim guidance from a Royal College of GPs point of view, but was much more evidence based and actually did have significant things that people really needed to be aware of. Listen and believe and building trust became really important, not dismissing as psychological, but using shared decision making, making sure that the patient and the clinician worked together. And really importantly, something that perhaps we hadn't realised in the early stages of long COVID was that this potential cognitive problems the, during the assessment. So the brain fog, sometimes word finding differences. And so the use of validated cognitive assessment tools came in. We worked really hard before the guideline was published to actually make sure codes were available for primary and secondary care so that when we saw somebody and were able to make a diagnosis, we could code that diagnosis so we could start to collate the evidence and we could start to feed this into our research. But also it became apparent that the vast majority of people who were presenting with ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 or post-COVID syndrome were really the white, middle-aged, uh, so really between sort of 25 and 45 type population and many more females than males. So one of the things the guideline came out to say that we know vulnerable communities were much harder hit with acute COVID so we must raise awareness in those harder to reach groups because if they have ongoing symptoms, they may not present themselves. So proactive case finding was, was considered. And we shouldn't dismiss anybody. So anyone with an acute infection of COVID-19 can go on to develop those longer term um, symptoms. And we shouldn't be predicting who would have prolonged symptoms based on sy sy symptoms alone. Remembering it's a multi-system disease and we've covered this a little bit, really taking that full holistic history. Sometimes screening questionnaires become useful, but only if you've got a clinical assessment. And it wasn't just the physical, psychological and emotional impact um, that we were seeing on patients, but also the impact on their life, because many of these were of working age. Shared decision making became really important, particularly when determining if face-to-face -face assessments were required, because during a lot of this, 
we were still locked down. And appropriate examinations were were uh, advised, particularly thinking about postural symptoms. We, of course, now know postural tachycardia syndrome is very common in our long COVID patients, but desaturation, making sure that if someone was short of breath, we checked their oxygen levels, but we also checked them when they were moving around. Identifying red flags that needed immediate referral, of course, very, very important, and multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or PIMS, PIMS now, as it's called, became very apparent. So children with ongoing symptoms, particularly persistent temperatures or skin rashes, needed that additional review and probably bloods on the same day. An alternative diagnoses we've talked about. So that initial primary care review, looking at that full history examination, readmission if they're unstable, but validation of those symptoms and all those symptoms we talked about and that we saw in our questionnaire, but not forgetting those red flags. So of course, with fatigue, if it's a woman, could she be pregnant? Is it heart failure? Is it cancer? Do we need to do blood and urine tests? Is it thyroid disease? Shortness of breath, are we thinking about lung cancer or heart failure? Do we need to do other investigations such as chest X-ray, spirometry, peak flow? Heart palpitations, again, we now know a lot of this is to do with postural tachycardia syndrome, but could there be an atrial fibrillation or have thyroid disease, or could it be anxiety? Mood changes became very apparent in our long COVID patients. And there was a real question at the beginning, was this primary psychiatric because of long COVID? Was it secondary to an adjustment type reaction? And we now know that the vast majority are secondary changes, but actually there is some primary psychiatric disease and mood changes. Those rashes, were they an acute illness? Were they allergy? Were they part of the, the PIMS type presentation in our, in our pediatric patients? And pain, a lot of people having pain, whether that's um, neuropathic type pain or the burning pain in their chest, of course, needed a full assessment. In terms of investigating, what became very apparent is a, a barrage of tests was not needed. We should absolutely do the blood tests and do the investigations depending on presentation. And the recommendation is that chest x-ray should only be uh, undertaken if there were ongoing respiratory symptoms. And if they'd had one previously, only if they had ongoing respiratory symptoms should it be repeated at about 12 weeks. ECGs and flash monitors, of course, for palpitations and chest pain and a more detailed investigation depending on those symptoms. And that may be in secondary care for us over in the UK. You may have other ways of doing that. Then we had to think about management. So is this self-management where we're advising people to look after themselves? Is it management within primary care, referral to secondary care? And of course, in the UK and certainly in England, we had post-COVID clinics set up. Or should they be admitted to hospital, which was actually very infrequent? So the treatment plan was as appropriate for the patient, very much patient-led what's most important to the patient. So self-management, and there is a website that I'll talk about in a second called Your COVID Recovery. Primary care support, we've got a, a wide multidisciplinary team in primary care in the UK, so supporting to investigate and follow up. We've got social prescribing, we've got care coordinators who can coordinate the care, particularly because this is multi-system and there may be in some instances multiple referrals. Primary care, psychological intervention or social services, occupational health, et cetera, et cetera. Specialist services if diagnostics are needed. The NICE guideline says consider referral from four weeks, but of course, realistically, it's going to take time to undertake the investigations to rule out other causes. And of course, many people we now know, and indeed the, the latest NICE guideline was updated at the end of last year after review of all the evidence. And it now is in agreement really that, that the vast majority of people will recover by 12 weeks. And of course, we may need uh, rehabilitation and recovery, and this has become the mainstay of treatment at the moment. So your COVID recovery, I thought I would point out, this is a website for everyone. It's free to access, so you can access it from Australia as well. It's funded now by the NHS, although it started, as I said, in the University of Leicester, started just for hospital discharge patients and now is for everyone, whether they were admitted to hospital or not. And there's two parts to this website. The first part is an open website. Anyone can um, get hold of it um, and, and utilize it. In January 2020, as I've said, it was updated for community patients, so is now inclusive for everyone. 
And the part two actually is behind uh, what I call a paywall. You don't have to pay for it, but it's actually behind a rehabilitation team assessment. So there are dedicated services within this um, package, which gives online uh, rehabilitation support in an individualized program. But people need to be seen by a rehabilitation team and have an assessment to determine which of those programs are, are important and remote support is available. And it covers all sorts of things, effects on your body, effects on your mind, talks about well-being, talks about road to recovery um, from a COVID-19, the post-COVID syndrome perspective. So a really, really important uh, website. And if you haven't seen it, please do have a look. There are other digital services that also um, help with rehabilitation because I think one of the huge things we realised is that the need for rehabilitation and support with long COVID or post-COVID syndrome is much greater than we had the workforce or the services to supply in the NHS in the UK. So this is another one. This is um, funded. There's research behind it. This is called Living with COVID Recovery. So please do again have a little look. There's an email there if you want to find out more about that. And this is a service where um, the people that run this say that with a single physio, you can probably look after at least 100, sometimes more than that patients per week uh, using one physio to oversee this, um, this Living with COVID Recovery. So please do contact them if you're interested. England then opened up post-COVID clinics. And the reason for this was because patients were saying they were getting referrals all over the place, multi-system disease. And the idea initially was that this was just a diagnostic clinic for investigation, a one-stop clinic where everything was looked at from mental health to physical health um, for adults and children. And they recognised actually that there was a gap for treatment and rehabilitation. So these services now in England have moved on to start to provide rehabilitation rather than sending back to primary care or onto other services. And the digital apps, the Living with COVID Recovery and Your COVID Recovery is being used quite extensively as well as traditional face-to-face -face rehabilitation. Other parts of the UK haven't used the uh, post-COVID clinics. So in Scotland, they haven't. And in Wales, they haven't. Instead, they've looked towards a primary care model using secondary care, as it would do usually for, for more uh, serious presentations. Northern Ireland's trying the post-COVID clinics out at the moment and is going to see how they go. But patients can be referred from anywhere effectively into a post-COVID clinic. We have huge amounts of patient information floating around, some of which is great. Um, so the, the sign guidance and the nice guidance, the Royal College guidance was turned into a long COVID booklet for patients. So a patient version of the guidance. And this I think is fantastic. If you just Google sign um, long COVID patient booklet, you'll be able to download a copy of that. You can print it out, forward it on to your patients so that they can really understand what should happen to them in that pathway. And of course, there's lots of other patient groups. Uh, we found peer support amongst our long COVID, our post-COVID syndrome patients has been really important. And some of the self-help groups have been incredibly useful. And some of them, actually, people have found that they've left because they haven't been as helpful as perhaps they'd hoped. So really important that they're, they're monitored. And there are some fantastic international ones um, that I think work really well. And just in the last couple of minutes, I thought I would talk about the workforce, because, of course, the workforce is hugely important, not only because we're seeing huge numbers of patients coming in with problems um, that we need to look after, but also a lot of our workforce caught COVID-19 at work. So whether they're teachers or whether they are healthcare professionals and actually the longer term effects of their COVID are now in, uh, affecting them. So there's two things. One thing is the education it becomes really, really important. And the Royal College of GPs have done lots and lots of educational work. So if you go to the Royal College of GP website and you put in post-COVID syndrome um, or just Google post-COVID syndrome webinar Royal College of GPs, you should find our webinar Remind, you should find our e-learning, all of which, again, are free and open to everyone. And we run monthly interactive education networks with national and international experts for all of our GPs as well. And we're pushing for more time because, of course, in our post pandemic recovery, we still have huge numbers um, of people with COVID. So we're expecting even more long COVID to come out. So if you think yesterday we had 200,000, over 200,000 cases of COVID um, that were reported and they were, they're the ones that we know of because our testing is not quite um, as, as thorough as perhaps it was a few months ago. 
but the complexity of this disease and the increased pressure on the workforce at the moment means that actually we, we need more time. So, so we're, we're trying to encourage our government to provide more time for GPs, but also for the system at large to deal with long COVID. And thinking about occupational health and sick leave, because this isn't universally um, given across the health and social care in the UK. And, and we're now finding a lot of our clinicians are, are running out of sick leave. So the Faculty of Occupational Medicine, this is a fantastic resource, have pulled together some advice for people returning to work with long COVID or post-COVID syndrome. So again, please do Google this. It's really useful. You can use that um, yourselves as well. And I thought I'd just finish off from a Stacey point of view, just to really tell you where we've got. So when I spoke to Stacey last, she actually said to me she didn't think she could have got through the last couple of years without the support of a GP. It's really important we involve all clinicians in the care of post-COVID syndrome. But actually having that relationship on the ground, in the community, being believed from day one, building up that partnership of trust that was a continued relationship, being investigated properly to rule out all of those other scary conditions that she was worried she had, being kept up to date and being communicated with as things change and as services change. But also really important, the honesty surrounding this disease. And, and when I say that, I think that really is probably the most important thing with our patients. We don't yet have all the answers. We've invested invested millions and millions, I think 50 million, maybe more into long COVID research in the UK. And we're hoping many of those studies will read out in 2023. And until they do, we're not actually going to have a lot of the answers. So at the moment, we are, to quote one of my esteemed colleagues in the UK, uh, Mel Heitman, we're building this plane as we fly it and we're finding out how things work as we go. And just to point out that after two years, Stacey is nearly back to where she was, but she can no longer work as a healthcare assistant and her sick pays ran out. So she sadly has lost her job and her career because of long COVID. And I think that's a really important learning point that this affects our patients and the people that we are working with for a long time in some instances. And it's really important we support them whilst we're looking after the health service at large. So I'm going to finish there. There's so much more I could say. Um, and just really to finish off by saying the latest figures from our Office of National Statistics survey show that we've got about 1.1 million people who are self-reporting to have long COVID in the UK, of which about 70,000, we think, from the self-reported survey have had those symptoms for more than a year. So the vast majority of people are recovering, and I think that's an important thing to hold on to, but there is significant long-term sequelae that we are seeing. Please do use my email address. Again, I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you today. I hope this has been useful, um, and I look forward to hearing the feedback. Many thanks, and bye-bye. Our next speaker is Professor Martin Henscher. Martin is the Henry Baldwin Professorial Research Fellow at the Menzies Institute for Medical Research at the University of Tasmania. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, hopefully you can see my slides. And I'd just like to acknowledge the peoples of the Lutrawita Nations and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of the lands uh, where we did the work that I'm going to be presenting briefly to you about. I'd also really like to acknowledge uh, my fantastic colleagues at Deakin uh, University and, and University of Tasmania, particularly Mary Angeles, who's really done uh, a lot of the heavy lifting in this work, and I'm hoping is watching this. Uh, so very much a, a fantastic team effort. So I'm gonna drive straight in to talking about the modeling of long COVID and what we've been doing. Um, we really got into this um, in, in working with Rebecca and colleagues um, at, uh, doing a, a briefing paper for the Diebel Institute about a year ago. Um, but long COVID clearly by then was, was already becoming an issue and it seemed to me to be something that we, we needed to try to get ahead of. Um, so modeling is a very important tool, not the only tool, but an important tool in trying to get to grips with uncertainty and thinking about future responses. So I'm going to talk to you about three different pieces of modelling we've done very briefly. Um, there are some different elements and these models cover slightly different things. All of them have looked at long COVID 
which I, we don't need to define now because I think our previous speakers have done a really good job about that. One of our models also, though, looks at the burden of two other important sequelae of COVID, which I just think it's quite important that we, we don't uh, uh, ignore. One is post-intensive care syndrome for people who've been uh, hospitalized in the ICU. Probably more importantly, but much more uncertainly, there is the other kinds of permanent disability, permanent impairment, which uh, it's sort of increasingly looking like quite small numbers, but not trivial numbers of, of COVID uh, patients might go on to suffer uh, for a long period thereafter. Now, all modeling rests on assumptions. Um, ass we have to use assumptions because we're uncertain and we, if we knew all the facts, it wouldn't be a model, it would be a description. But so we're trying to work with uncertainty in this modeling. So key parameters just to think about and key assumptions that we're thinking about here is that clearly there's some relation between uh, how many people to go, go on to get long COVID and uh, the number of people obviously who have COVID-19 infections in the first place. Um, but what we really don't know still is whether that relationship is changing with different variants. Um, do we, we really don't have the numbers yet to know, particularly uh, after Omicron, uh, has, uh, has risk changed in that? We are getting better evidence that there are some other modifiers of risk. So, for example, it does, I think it's looking increasingly strongly like vaccination does reduce your likelihood of going on to develop long COVID. So that's some of those factors are important to think about. Big uncertainties, though, about the duration of long COVID and the trajectory of recovery. Um, as others have said, most people who uh, develop long COVID will recover over time clearly, but it's still less than clear exactly what is that trajectory, precisely what are the numbers there. And lots of uncertainties about really the burden of this, what actually is the severity of long COVID, how do we measure it, et cetera. Some studies just in the last weeks beginning to come out with quality estimates, for example, of long COVID, a really good UK study. Too late to go into our modeling at the moment, but this, some of this evidence is beginning to come out now. And then finally, the key uh, limitation in all of this is obviously about data and sources. So uh, we have a very small number of um, good Australian studies. We've relied particularly on one by Betty Liu and colleagues. Um, the gold standard, really, that's coming out, I think, on the, the largest, most robust measurements of, of long COVID is really by the UK Office for National Statistics. There's lots of studies of long COVID, but they're all complex. Many of them are looking at hospital cohorts. Many of them are looking at quite small numbers of patients. ONS have dived in and looked at very large numbers in the population with very big surveys. Now, where are we and where's long COVID in Australia? Well, look, until a very few months ago, there just wasn't gonna be much long COVID in Australia because there simply hadn't been much COVID in Australia. Uh, and then obviously uh, we've had Omicron, which has changed our situation completely. So our first uh, foray into this game, which is now a year ago, where we looked at um, how many long COVID cases might there have been in Australia at the end of March last year, based on some very preliminary modeling, we were coming up with a few thousand, really two and a half thousand to 5,000 people at that stage, we might've had long COVID. That was a very simple kind of uh, testing the water. So then um, during the course of last year, we did more work, um, focusing more on what might be the burden of disease of um, post-COVID sequelae. Um, and we tried to, at that stage, still in the absence of Australian data and indeed in the absence of large outbreaks in Australia, what we tried to do is we took the Doherty modelling, the Australians in the audience will remember that, from which was the, the modelling that was used by National Cabinet to think about how the national reopening plan was going to work. 
We took that Doherty modeling, which had great work on different parameters, numbers of infections, deaths, uh, hospitalizations, ICU, et cetera. Um, and we tried to apply a daily burden of disease model to that Doherty modeling um, and um, making a couple of critical assumptions that I think it's really important to spell out. We've assumed in that model that most long COVID does resolve over time, as, as others have said. But we also, in that model, we looked not just at long COVID, we did look at PICS, post-intensive care syndrome, and we also looked at some of these other permanent illnesses and disabilities that the evidence was beginning to come out from, assuming that they then might have a lifetime duration. So that's things like cardiac uh, disease, um, potentially the increased, increased risk of developing diabetes post-COVID, various some neurological issues, some of these things. Um, and we took daily weights from the literature for similar and equivalent conditions. And there's a preprint that you can find if you click through those slides. The key thing we found, and this is an important message I really want to get across, is compared to the first year of COVID in 2020, where far away the largest um, contributor to the burden of disease in Australia was mortality, even as we looked at the Doherty model, and if you remember Doherty was beginning to factor in vaccination, etc., we could see a shift of the burden of mortality beginning to decrease, and in fact, the importance of the burden of long COVID starting to go up. Um, the burden of PICS, of post-intensive care syndrome, fell because fewer people were being uh, admitted to intensive care units. Again, this international trend we've been seeing. However, what's critical here is once we include the possibility of permanent illness, so some of these long-term lifelong illnesses, um, we see suddenly the burden of morta from mortality gets relegated to second place. And quite quickly, even really quite small proportions of COVID cases, if they actually develop long-term illnesses, so the cardiac complications, diabetes, et cetera, probably, the burden of that permanent illness becomes the major contributor to overall burden. And that's something we might want to come back to. So then finally, in the last couple of months, we've then tried to do some quick modeling once we actually got into the Omicron wave. So finally, we were there, finally, the large numbers we'd, that we'd successfully dodged for two years caught up with us. Um, and we tried to look at very simply what was this gonna mean potentially for numbers of long COVID cases? Not for PICS, not for permanent disability, just for long COVID. Um, we made some very simple assumptions. We could, we, we just, we reckon we got to the peak in mid January. So with very sophisticated epidemiological modeling, we doubled the number from the beginning of the Omicron outbreak to the end, and we were pretty close. We, rate, we reckon there'd be 3.1 million cases between the end of November and the middle of January. In fact, there were just under 3.3 million. So for me, I was pretty happy with that. And then we used similar approaches um, with four different scenarios of how long COVID might play out. And in particular, we looked quite hard at the potential uh, impact of vaccination on long COVID numbers and did some sensitivity analysis about different levels of effectiveness of vaccination on long COVID numbers. So these are our four methods, really, how they play out in terms of numbers here, quite they're probably a little small to look at, but all, what I really want you to focus on is two of these models. Um, so the Liu et al model and one of the ONS approaches, ONS approach two, start with quite high numbers of people or high proportion of people developing long COVID, but then fall rapidly. Um, most of these studies actually haven't followed people for very long. The maximum period in these studies people have been followed for is up to 24 weeks. So we applied exponential decay functions to try to push these curves out over time. And what you see is that with some of the models, you end up going down to very low numbers um, by before we get to a year. So in fact, two of these approaches, we were getting only potentially hundreds of, in single 
you know, 100 to 200 people with long COVID uh, after 52 weeks, which doesn't chime with what we're seeing from other international studies. Two of the ONS approaches, though, give us quite different results. They start with lower and more conservative proportions, but they track over time the, the reduction in people with long COVID over time is much slower. And so we do end up with larger numbers of people still with long COVID at, uh, at one year. And where we got to with this really um, was um, using these models to look at how many long COVID cases might there be 12 weeks after initial infection. So if we're thinking about the beginning of the Omicron wave, we're kind of at that point really, we're beginning to be at that 12 weeks after Omicron um, stage now. Um, I think we're probably looking at, you know, 60,000 to 200,000 or so is our central estimate. Um, how effective the vaccines have been is important. That makes quite a big difference. If vaccines have been very effective in preventing long COVID, we might be um, below 50,000 people. Uh, but if vaccines have actually proved to be not very effective, we might have hundreds of thousands. Then if we think about how many long COVID cases we might have in a year's time, a year out from their initial infection, as I said, we've actually, we kind of tossed out two of our scenarios because those exponential decay curves got us down almost to zero well before it was plausible. So using the other two scenarios, I think we're probably looking at most likely tens of thousands to maybe 100,000 or so cases still with long COVID from the Omicron wave as we've looked at it. This is saying nothing about any future waves or how, and as you could see from the, the COVID cases, we all know we're already going back up again. So this is just from the kind of summer uh, Omicron wave. Um, but I think from that wave, probably not more, I think than 200,000 people uh, or less than 200,000 people to be honest, um, by a year out from initial infection. Key points really I'd like you to take away those. As the mortality rate decreases, the relative burden of long COVID and of other permanent illnesses increases. Um, and that's really important. The, 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 the long COVID and permanent disability really will be what is driving the big burden of, of, uh, of COVID going forwards. Um, I think the kind of numbers we're talking about for long COVID in Australia after Omicron now are significant. They'll stress the system, but hopefully they're not overwhelming if they're managed well. But I think it's always possible to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, and if we manage this badly and we're running into future waves that add more burden, actually this could done poorly could be a really big burden on the health system uh, for some years to come. Um, I'd, you know, caveat everything I've said in the fact that our understanding of the duration of long COVID and of these other permanent illnesses is still very limited and we need a lot more data there. So just finishing off, what do I want to see going forward? I really want to see surveillance. We've got almost no surveillance in Australia. Now we must get good high quality surveys and we need to follow the model of what they've done with the ONS. And I'd really like to see the Australian Bureau of Statistics doing those surveys and not researchers. I'd like the ABS to be on the ground doing this stuff. And we need to really follow people up over time in detail we need to understand the impact on their health related quality of life, and we really need to understand employment and economic impacts. Mustn't forget prevention, because every case of COVID-19 we prevent is someone who's not going to go on to get long COVID. It's often forgotten in this, but it's really central. I think we really need to move into working on our care models and our coordination of care. We've got to mobilize the private sector for this. We can't just shunt this into the public hospital system. Um, and, but if we do it well, this could actually be transformative, not only for long COVID, 
but actually for things like ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, people with autoimmune um, illnesses, people who are poorly served by a health system at the moment. And finally, we really have to ask patients what they want and need. What care do they want? What kind of support do they need? And we've really got to get them involved in uh, leading and co-designing both the research and services going forward. Thank you very much. You're on mute, Rebecca. You'd, you'd think after two years of, of Zoom we'd get this. Our last speaker for the evening is Professor Mark Morgan. He is co-chair co of the National COVID-19 COVID Clinical Evidence Task Force, Mild and Chronic Care Panel. Um, and he'll be talking about the Australian evidence-based guidelines for long COVID. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Can I just confirm you can see my slide there? Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work of the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force, because I think this is a, a remarkable piece of capacity building and infrastructure building that will be critical for um, successful um, generation of long COVID guidelines as we start to understand more about this condition. So the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force brings together 33 peak bodies and hundreds of clinicians volunteering their time to, with the purpose of building um, a structure that gives us guidelines for COVID treatment, to do this in a continuous way with a, a weekly update based on evidence surveillance and to become the, the trusted, you know, the source of truth for the management of, of COVID-19 in Australia. Um, important to mention the funders because we need to know whether this is biased by funding, but Australian government, um, state governments and some philanthropic foundations are funding this work. So why a living guideline? Um, we know there's been a tremendous amount of research done on COVID treatments. Um, a couple of weeks ago, more than 600 randomized controlled trials and about 4,000 in the pipeline, hundreds of thousands of studies. I think in the first week of March, another 14 randomized controlled trials were done. And as any of you that work in the health system will know, there's a a smorgasbord of confusing expensamab and yet another rib and variations of fear treatments that's really hard to keep up with. So guidelines are important that can make life easier. Um, it needs to be a, a, a living guideline because of the rate of change of information. And the sort of output that comes from this work um, are evidence-based grade um, designed guidelines demonstrated in the MAGIC app that really give a clear, simple recommendation that defines a population, defines a treatment, and then explains whether or not there's good, strong evidence for that treatment and whether it's applicable and appropriate. And then in parallel to that are our, 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 um, clinical flowcharts. And at the moment, we have a clinical flowchart for long COVID that's based on a collation of existing evidence adapted and adopted, um, adapted for an Australian context by our expert panels. Um, and that's the, 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 um, the state of play at the moment is because we don't have evidence for specific treatments for long COVID yet. To give you a flavor of the size of this um, infrastructure building, um, the, um, there are over 250 clinicians involved in um, the task force, 13 standing expert panels, also assisted by conflict of interest panels, consumer representative panels, um, and leadership groups. Um, we have 15 clinical flow charts about dis different aspects of managing COVID and um, over 165 treatment recommendations that are evidence based. So, in our flowchart for people with post-COVID-19, we went with a pragmatic definition, wanting to provide um, some guidance uh, for clinicians 
to cover both ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 in that four to 12 week period, and also the three months and on or 12 weeks and on period um, that, that uh, is, is defined as long COVID. So the second step of our, of, our, of our work was to do an evidence review. And as we've heard, you can be symptomatic with post-COVID-19 if you've had mild disease, if you've had severe disease, if you're an adult, if you're a child, um, and there's a big variation in, in people's experience. And as I say, no evidence-based recommendations for particular interventions. Um, so our expert panel and, 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 and flowchart thought that, as we've heard before, that the communication with patients, taking this seriously, validating their experiences was very important. The coordination of care was important, and we focused on uh, a primary care approach and then multidisciplinary team where available and where necessary. We thought it was important to um, talk about managing the risk of infection, um, defining whether it was probable diagnosis and searching for other conditions, as we've heard with international guidelines, and, and also assessing for red flags, things that need immediate treatment. We looked carefully at the sort of range of symptoms. because We didn't want people with um, less common post-COVID symptoms to um, fail to, to access uh, treatment and the, and the right, uh, and the right um, care. And we included in our guideline a consideration of the post-intensive care syndrome um, as it was important. When it comes to management, very similar to the international guidelines, um, we, we talk about um, basically managing long COVID in the way that we've learned to manage other post-viral conditions and uncertainty and other chronic conditions. Um, so not specific at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and to all our speakers. Um, at this point, I'd like to open up the floor to um, questions. If you have a question, please put it into the, the chat function. No, so I'll start, I'll start off. Um, we know that some populations have suffered more throughout the um, pandemic from being able to comply with public health measures to accessing testing, um, to accessing treatment. Um, what do we know or even suspect about um, equity and long COVID? And, um, and the second part to that question is really, how can we um, support more equitable access to care? Mark, perhaps you'd like to take that one? Um, I'm happy to. Well, in terms of the epidemiology, there has been a lot of descriptions uh, of the epidemiology of um, long COVID symptoms, and uh, not so thoroughly in Australia as in other countries. Um, we've heard already that um, women are more likely to um, suffer with long COVID symptoms, We've also heard that the, the increased number of, of, of acute symptoms, and certainly for the, um, the disability and post-intensive care syndrome, the severity of your illness would make a difference as well. Um, we also know that um, with all healthcare issues, if you, if you look at um, social disadvantage and reduced access to care, that those communities are the ones that suffer most um, and those individuals are the ones that suffer most. I think equity is um, going to be helped by what we've learned about um, online resources and I think um, presentation about the work of the uh, in the UK to, to make those resources available um, to as wide a number of people as possible is going to help. Um, I think there is a danger if we go with a single um, approach of multidisciplinary clinics because naturally they're going to sit in large teaching hospitals in urban centres and it will increase inequity. I think we probably need a blended primary care and 
um, multidisciplinary approach um, with the appropriate triaging, but probably centered on primary care because that's the only really distributed way of delivering healthcare we have at the moment. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, we have a question that's come in um, so, uh, from the audience. Is there any evidence yet on the difference of, of long COVID between Delta and Omicron? Sick, perhaps you'd like to answer, you'd be able to answer that one? I, I'll try to do the, my best. Uh, but you know, it's the lack of, of information that we have, so even the best is not uh, that good. Uh, actually, after uh, Delta, we, do, we did in-depth uh, studies. With, we gave the patients the SF36. Uh, we did MOCA for everyone. We did a lot of uh, in-depth studies, so we could uh, have the uh, exact symptoms and uh, size of the patients. After the Omicron, we did do the same because, you know, we thought we have enough information. And uh, so actually, we, I really cannot tell you if after the Omicron it's the same or not. From the clinical perspective, you know, when a patient comes in and uh, 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 complains, uh, I think that one of the things that we saw a lot after the uh, Delta and the Alpha waves, the first waves, we saw the loss of smell and uh, uh, taste and hair loss, which we saw in many, many patients with long COVID. And I don't see it now with the after Omicron long COVID. I'm sure there are more uh, difference, some of them more subtle, some of them uh, more uh, uh, notable. And uh, actually, uh, we saw that we have to do now the same study with uh, in depth study like we did uh, after the first waves, so we can answer this question. So I, ha I hope I have better information in the future. Thanks, Itzik. Um, our next question is around people um, with undiagnosed COVID and um, they might be going on to develop post COVID-19 symptoms that are being missed or misdiagnosed. Um, what safety nets do we need to be developing for this cohort? Um, Martin, are you able to tackle that one? Yeah, so I think thinking about that, there's a couple of things we need to do. I think, you know, the, the speakers who talked about guidelines and clinical practice have quite rightly said it's essential to take really good histories from people to really work through what's going on, work them up well. But I think, honestly, that step one, though, is given we've just had this massive outbreak and we would expect large numbers of people to be presenting with long COVID, health professionals just need to have front of mind now that long COVID is a highly likely diagnosis for people coming, um, you know, coming to them with these kinds of symptoms. And I think we just, we have to learn from other countries where it's clearly been really difficult culturally for some health professionals to get their head around this and, and to perhaps get out of uh, how they were previously practicing. So there's a real, it's difficult to use the right word, but there's a real kind of communications job, I think, there with health professionals. So not, you don't want to assume that everything, everybody's got long COVID, but equally it's, it's highly likely given where we are now. So, that, so that's number one. Then I think in terms of like literal safety nets, um, as we talked about in that uh, Diebel Institute brief now a year ago, but there, there's a lot, there's work to be done in Medicare and MBS on making sure we've got the right items, particularly making sure literally the MBS safety net um, is uh, tuned to correctly support people who might now have long COVID and might need, you know, quite. Um, long lasting levels of input and therefore it gets quite expensive so I think we've really got to look at Medicare and um, more widely for economic and welfare policy look we've got to look at what are the consequences of, of this for people's ability to earn coming back to the previous question about inequality look this um, quite possibly more socially and economically disadvantaged people are going to be more at risk for this but certainly once they have long covid those are the people for whom this is going to bite really badly economically 
and we have really got uh, you know the the governments, the federal government in particular, has really got to look at retooling the social safety net to work properly for for people in this position. Thanks, for Anton. Matt, did you want to make a comment yeah, as well? Look, I, I would agree with with those points, and certainly the need to build capacity for the health system and for practitioners within the health system to to uh, provide um, uh, rehabilitation, multi. Um, and, and, and help from a whole bunch of different professions if that's necessary. I also think it's probably not absolutely essential to diagnose people with long COVID. If they have distressing symptoms that are consistent, then at the moment, because we don't have specific long COVID treatments, um, we can apply the same principles to helping those people. So I'd be, I would think the same system or the people that have got post-viral fatigue or just unexplained um, groups of symptoms should be able to access the same rehab. But we do need to grow that ability to do that rehab. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, our next question, I think, will also be for you, Martin. Um, it says, Tasmania seems to be lagging behind in any help for long COVID sufferers. Do you know if there's anything happening uh, in Tasmania about this? So my honest answer as a fairly recent re-arrival in, into Tasmania is um, I am not aware of, let's say, major plans in Tasmania, but that, does, that doesn't mean it's not happening, but I don't know about them. But what I, I'd maybe flip that around and say, look, I'd love to hear from people particularly, um, and I am in, in, in touch with a, a couple of people in Tasmania already, but people who, uh, would like to see more action happening. I'd love to make contact and see what we can do actually about advocating for this uh, at the state level. Yeah. Thanks. Um, what can be done for regional and remote populations who develop uh, long COVID syndrome? And I'd like to add to that, um, Mark, without putting you on the spot, um, is does the task force have any plans to develop guidelines um, specific for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Thank you. Um, the, answering the first part first, um, I, I think we have learned it is possible to, to deliver allied health and medical consults um, remotely, um, and that should be facilitated and an expectation that, 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 um, that, that we build, more to save uh, the burden of travel for individuals than because we can't afford to provide services in, in rural and remote areas. So I think we should be building that um, and, and maintaining that capacity and not putting artificial constraints around um, access to telehealth and video health as a for fear of, of wasting money. Uh, I, I can't imagine people having um, wasteful consult in large numbers. I think everyone's time is valuable. So I, I think if there's a need, we should be um, uh, fulfilling that need as best we can. Um, the second part, which was about um, specific populations within the task force, we have been working on guns for specific populations where there is evidence of a different approach that's needed. And we work particularly in the um, primary and chronic care, care panel. About half of the panel um, were people that um, lived and worked in remote areas as we started this journey. And so we were acutely aware. But um, it's really the operationalization, the implementation of clinical guidelines and treatment guidelines, where how it, how it plays out in different uh, parts of the of, of the country um, comes into play. So the actual decision on you know, whether drug A is good for COVID or not and how it should be given is sort of a little bit independent of that. And then the op operation of it, the implementation, is where it becomes really important for, for um, each community and, and uh, each part of the country. Thanks, Mark. I just wanted to add for the questions about also uh, with long distance that uh, we opened here in a, a Shiba, a Shiba Connect it's called and actually it's a rehabilitation unit 
which gives you rehabilitation services uh, digital, uh, digitally uh, with uh, trainers that you can uh, connect with them and train at home with uh, occupational therapists that's done. It works fantastic. So we could really actually almost uh, close uh, completely the uh, in-hospital long COVID uh, clinic because most of the patients preferred to do it uh, through the digital uh, clinic. And uh, we have a really good experience with it. Thanks, Itzik. Um, the next question I'd like you all to have an um, uh, attempt to answer at is communication has been critical throughout the pandemic. What recommendations would you have for governments and health systems in terms of long COVID? And how can we anticipate messaging might need to change over the upcoming months and years? Um, Itzik, would you like to comment on what what communication has been like in Israel and, and, and how effective government has been there? I must say that here the system works uh, probably a little different. And uh, uh, actually, it's, uh, we have four HMOs, uh, which uh, cover all uh, the population. And uh, they are uh, in constant uh, connection. Uh, with the government on the one side, with the hospitals on the other side, so we have a very good uh, uh, system which uh, everyone can connect with everybody. So, uh, you know, if we need information from uh, one of the HMOs, so they need the information for us, it's uh, after we are doing, of course, the ethical uh, things and everything, it's very easy to communicate between all the parties. And uh, in our uh, major teams, uh, like those, you know, combating the uh, epidemic in the acute phase. Now about the long COVID, we are sitting all together, representatives from the government, from the HMOs and from the hospitals. But I think that it's possible because Israel is really a tiny country, you know, with 10 million uh, uh, people, every physician knows every physician almost. So. I think it's much easier to do this communication than in Australia. Thanks, Itzik. Mark, would you like to, to comment? Yes, look, at the moment, there seems to be a lot of communication, too much, and from too many different sources and saying slightly too many different things, and particularly if you add in um, less reliable sources. Um, so I, I actually think that um, communication needs to be prioritized, needs to be resourced, uh, things need to be translated. And I actually think we should be shamelessly borrowing and stealing and adapting from places like the UK who put quite a lot of resources into, in, into the messaging. But the, the other point is that because the messages have to change, I think we need to treat um, the, uh, the, the population as able to understand that I know people want black and white, but actually at the moment, we can only give information that we have and, and to really kind of um, signpost that the information will change over time and, and, and really concentrate on, on, on making, um, showing people where to look for reliable information. Thank you. Martin? Yeah. Two things for me really on that communication space. I think in a, in a carefully designed way, I think governments need to be um, getting the message out to people that, yeah, you look, you don't need to have been severely ill with COVID to go on to develop long COVID. So, you know, if uh, you're not recovering, if you're, you know, don't suffer in silence, don't be scared to seek medical advice. I think that's a really important message to get out to, to the population. I think the other one though, um, is um, we, mustn't, we mustn't let the desire and the desire to communicate the kind of living with COVID story that we've been, or that, that many governments have been wanting to project um, we mustn't let that interfere with doing the things we need to do to actually live with COVID. So we need to set up the surveillance systems. We need to set up the services and service models and safety nets that people are going to need 
actually coming out of the other side of COVID, mm -hmm. because that's what living with COVID really is, is, is about. And we mustn't, you know, let, um, let's say, more politicised uh, desires contaminate uh, what we're actually doing and, and the factual content of what we're communicating. Thanks. Um, Martin, can I direct an, another question at you? Um, given the treatment pathways recommended for, for long COVID, to what extent will out-of-pocket expenses be an issue for those seeking care for long COVID? Um, that's a great question. And the answer is, particularly if you're unlucky, they, they could be significant. Um, so when I was talking about, I think we need to mobilize the resources of the private sector and coordinate with the private sector. I think this is something where we need to look now at, are there ways to come up with new models of how we finance some of this stuff and particularly deal with this out of pocket payment problem, which, you know, that's the core problem of really at the heart of much of what's wrong in the Australian health system at the moment. Um, how can we look at that? It, we absolutely, as I said, we've got to make sure that the MBS safety net, those kinds of measures really are not letting these pe people in this position fall through the cracks. But this is a really good time to look at some different models of maybe how can we use the private sector, but start to reduce, if not perhaps eliminate, some of these out-of-pocket payments. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, Mark, do you know if there are any plans to open a, a post-COVID clinic nationally? And um, can, you, can you comment? Uh, I actually don't know exactly how far those plans have got. I know that uh, there are centres mostly around the respiratory clinics that are um, starting to build that expertise. Um, but uh, in terms of um, planning at a state-by-state -state level to open up post-COVID clinics, um, I don't have that information. Just going back to the previous question, if I may, um, Martin was talking about um, alternative ways to deliver, and, and we've heard an echo of that in the presentations. Um, so certainly uh, a greater use of group consultations, of peer-to-peer -peer support, of um, digital resources that are not kind of one-on-one -on -one with, a, with a practitioner, those things help. And um, certainly at the college, we've been working with the Consumers Health Forum to try and um, build a social prescribing system. Social prescribing is where um, uh, uh, health practitioners refer to non-health services and connect people into non-health services. So that might be opportunities to, um, uh, to develop skills, to, to rehabilitate, um, it doesn't need that kind of high-end, highly trained specialists. So I think uh, there are ways and alternative models that are not as expensive as paying for um, a one-on-one -on -one time with a highly trained allied health provider or, 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 um, or doctor or nurse. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, and the last question for the evening, is there any evidence of the impact of long COVID on the healthcare workforce? and the impact of the capacity of the health system to provide services to the community. Um, Martin, have you, have you had a look at that through, through your work? So um, I've read a fair amount about this. I would not pretend to have you know, reviewed systematically what the evidence are, on this is, but I think um, as, I, as I can see it, I think, in other countries that have had much more severe earlier waves and hence have had you know, big numbers of people with long COVID for longer periods, um, there's certainly some reason to believe that it's disproportionately affected healthcare workers. Um, it's certainly, I think, little reason to believe that, it, that healthcare workers are less likely to be impacted by long COVID than other people. Um, I think, do, will that impact on the healthcare system? Well, you know, at an operational level, um, yes, depending on the numbers and really, you know, how, how many people 
uh, who are out, out of the workforce for how long is, is the fundamental question there. I think though it's kind of a multiplier because we do have this evidence both internationally and in Australia that you know some healthcare professionals are leaving the health workforce for other reasons uh, as well. So if you've got kind of a, a, a long COVID is yet another force kind of driving people out of the healthcare workforce, that's clearly not going to be a good thing. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, so I'd like to thank all our amazing speakers for joining us today. A copy of uh, the presentation will be made available to you shortly. But to find out more about our future events, please head to um, the AHA website. Again, thank you everyone for joining us and I look forward to seeing you again at one of our upcoming events. Thank you.